we're super grateful that all of most of our programming is free and open to the public. Um, and if you would ever like to support the work that we're doing, both of our web pages have um, kind of like donation sections. Um, so thank you to everyone in the community for making these possible for us to do for free. And before I introduce Karen, I'm going to pass it over to Jake for some technology help. Thanks, Linda. Hi, everybody. My name's Jake. Um, thanks for tuning in today. I wanted to point out a couple of key features for your use this afternoon. Um, down at the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat box and you can ask questions or I think there's going to be some interactive guessing going on throughout the presentation. So that will be the place you can drop um, whatever you think you're responding to an audio clip, I, I take it. So we'll, there'll be more on that later, but the chat box is where you want to leave all of that. Um, the direct questions for Karen will save for the end portion of our um, presentation, and at which point Lander and I will kind of comb through your chats and your questions throughout the presentation and ask them to Karen directly. Um, if you'd like to ask Karen your question on your own, you can use the raised your hand feature, which is the little tiny hand down at the bottom of your screen. We'll save that for the end of the presentation as well. Um, but that will give you the option to either ask Karen your question with your audio or you can tune in with your video as well if you so choose. Um, and I think that is it. So I'll hand it back over to Lander for our formal introduction. Thanks, Jake. That's great. So we're super excited to have Karen Zimmerman with us today. She is a Maine Master Naturalist and the author of this beautiful book, Night Walk, Using All Your Senses to Explore the Natural World. And maybe Karen will indicate whether she has copies available for purchase during her presentation. Um, but thank you so much, Karen, for being here with us. And we're super excited to, to have you here. OK. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Lander. I'm excited to be here as well. And hopefully all the sounds will play. We'll find out when we get there. So tonight, we are going to be looking at animal adaptations. We're going to take a look at how other animals have adapted their senses to life at night. We're going to tune into our senses. And I think at the end, we may have enough time to look at a few slides that um, give a quick preview of the different seasons and different things that you can smell and hear during different times of the year. So quickly, what are adaptations? They can be physical or they can be behavioral. What they do is they help an animal survive by escaping from predators, finding food, finding a mate, or adjusting to habitat. Those are the basic four things any animal needs to do to survive, and different adaptations help that to happen. Nocturnal adaptations are sometimes the same as other adaptations, but oftentimes they're different because more than half the animals that live on this planet are nocturnal. They're eating, they're being eaten, they're reproducing and they're going about their nightly business. Again, those four critical things for any species to survive. But in low light, they adapt by maybe altering their vision. We're not going to go into that very much, but they will enhance their other senses to make up for limited night vision. They may change their behavior. They may have big ears. They may have greater sense of smell, sometimes specialized hair, hairs for feeling vibrations, lots of different ways that they will adapt. And nocturnal. Nocturnal is what we're going to be focusing on. Those are the animals, the mammals that are primarily active at night. Black bear, red fox, skunks, flying squirrels, and coyotes. Diurnal, that's us, day people. They're active primarily during the day. Red squirrels, bald eagles, and homo sapiens. Then there's that wonderful word, word crepuscular. And that's for animals that are active primarily at twilight. And it could be dawn or it could be dusk. Beavers, deer, and moose are examples of that. So why would animals pick a different phase of the day for being active? And why in particular would they pick being active at night? Some think it's easier to avoid detection. The darkness helps both the predators and the prey move about a little bit more quietly or at least not so visibly. Prey animals also use the cover of night to forage more safely when while predators will capitalize on that same darkness to ambush their prey more easily. 
there are more prey animals out at night, which may be why predators come out at night to hunt them so they can get their food. And then there's some speculation that there's less competition at night. If everybody's someplace during the day, you might want to creep out at night when there are fewer people or fewer mammals out there. So crepuscular gets further divided into two more very awesome words, which are matutinal and vespertine. That may bring you back to your camp days when you were a kid, when you heard matins for morning and vespers at evening. Praying mantis is one example of an animal that will only do its baiting display in the very early hours of dawn. Why is that? It's the female. What she does is she comes out and she makes herself very, really visible, grows her size so that she'll be obvious to a possible mate, get some attention. And that is the time when there aren't many other animals around. So she is maybe less likely to be preyed upon by her natural predators. It is the mating position is, of course, when you're most vulnerable. So to do it at a time when you're less likely to be attacked is a good time. And that's probably why praying mantis has adapted that particular habit. Vespertine, owls, bats, woodcock, that's the evening hours and animals. I see a cat, cats too. <laughs> um, and Owls, for example, have their eyes so large in their socket that they can't move them. Another adaptation. And then there are us. We're going to talk about us for a minute before we go into the sounds and the different senses for all the different creatures. We're diurnal, but we need light. We use artificial light almost all the time. There's probably nobody here watching this who hasn't um, been with a light source, whether it's their phone or the little gleaming light in their car or their headlights, as you see here, that go more than six hours during the day without artificial light. It's rare for us to do that. Our habits are so, we're so driven by light that we tend to forget about our other senses or we aren't as tuned into them. We're bombarded vision, vision, vision. We're so busy processing that maybe we're not paying attention to sounds or feeling or smells. So what I'm going to ask you all to do is in a minute, not yet, I'm going to have you close your eyes on the count of three and turn off all that vision, all that bombardment for just a minute. I promise I'm not going to tiptoe away and leave you all sitting here looking at the screen. It's going to seem like an eternity, but if you're game for it, one, two, Three, close the eyes. Okay, I'm cutting it short. That was only 25 seconds. Felt like forever, right? I was paying attention to what I was hearing and I noticed a clock that I never knew was ticking way back somewhere. I'm gonna to have to find that out. What did you feel over here? Is anybody maybe more aware of their chair that they're sitting on? I noticed how hard this little kitchen chair is. And when we're bombarded by our senses or by Vision, visionary data, we don't really pay attention to these things, but we're going to want to. In the chat box. What was that? We have a few people in the chat box saying they heard crickets. They cool. heard their tummy growl. Yes. They heard wavelets and it felt restful. I heard the washer. Nice. Nice. So those are things that we might not have heard if we had our eyes open. Not that our hearing got better, but that we were focusing on it. And that's what we're going to do throughout this little talk. We're going to pay attention to hearing for the most part, since we're doing this this way, I can't give you things to touch. I can't give you things to smell. I definitely can't give you things to taste. So we're going to focus on hearing. Every once in a while, the screen will come up with a big green question mark. And if technology is on our side. I'm going to play a sound and you can try and guess what it is. So 
Let's give it a go. Do we hear anything? No. It's so cute. Any guesses? Do we, have... we had somebody guess a porcupine. <gasps> Whoa. Okay. I should. I gave it away already. Yes. Any other guesses? <laughs> Uh, and just everybody else was kind of generalizing as an animal. I was going to yeah. guess an otter, but I guess I was wrong. I guess it was a porcupine. Yes. So, uh, let me slide this here. Porcupine. Yep. So we're going to look at touch for a little bit. Porcupine, of course. Never pet a porcupine. That's what I grew up with, but apparently porcupines make okay pets in that if you pet them the right way, they actually like it and will respond like a cat. I'm not sure I personally want a porcupine as a pet, but apparently they do make good pets. So they use the sense of touch. They're not using their own sense of touch. What they're capitalizing on is the other animal sense of touch, causing them pain. So each quill in their 30,000 on a porcupine has up to 800 barbs, and they're all located in the first less than eighth of an inch on the very tip. They're not thrown, they're easily detached though, you just brush by it and we'll get one on you. And they don't really, it's not their first line of defense, they'll turn around, they'll stamp a little bit, but then they will turn around and whack their tail at you and they puncture very, very easily. There's actually less pressure involved for a porcupine quill to go into your skin than a hypodermic needle. You know how easily those get driven in. And because they are that easy to go in, they can get into your bloodstream and they can puncture vital organs. So that's why it is a danger if you have a pet that gets, um, has an encounter with a porcupine. And here's another creature that depends on touch, the star-nosed mole. Also nocturnal, we don't see as many of those as we do porcupines, but that's because they live under the grounds. Most people see them when a cat brings one in or when there's one dead in their yard. You don't commonly see them out and about. They have these amazing appendages with 100,000 nerve fibers, fibers, and they're active constantly, 22. You can count them, I drew them. There are 22 appendages there. And what they do is they pick something up and they touch it and they decide. Um, if it's something good to eat or not. And they do that in something like two tenths of a second. They could, they're just constantly picking something up, going, yep, it's food, yum, yum, yum. No, it's not, tossing it over their shoulders. They also have those giant paws and can excavate seven or eight feet of soil in an hour, which when you think about the size of them with all the dirt up above them is in a pretty, pretty amazing number. Raccoons also depend on touch. In a similar way to the star-nosed mole, they use their sense of touch to decide if something is good to eat or not. What they do when they grab their food and are putting it in water is they're getting their paws wetter. They have a really thin leathery surface that becomes more pliable and sensitive when it's wet. So that gives them the ability to decide if something is edible or not. It's sometimes called dousing. And that allows them to decide if they want to eat something or not, even though they can't see it. They can do it at dark without seeing their food. They're using their sense of touch. Another example of touch, and this isn't for food, this is for reproduction, is the painted turtle. That hand that you see at the top, I guess I can point to it. Look, this works, um, is the paw or the hand of a painted turtle and it's a male painted turtle. Only the males have these long nails, long front toenails, which they use to gently stroke the female's head and neck while courting. If the female is receptive, she will accept the stroking of the front legs of the male with her much, much, much shorter nails. And that's not what I wanted. We're still on touch. You know, this doesn't look like touch. It is, it is pretty fascinating. That's an eggplant flower from my garden. There is something that the common Eastern 
bumblebee uses, and it's called sonication or buzz pollination to get nectar out of those anthers. Those here, I will use these kind. These are the anthers and they look like bananas. They're tubes and the pollen is inside. Not like most other flowers, it's out there ready for anything that comes by to pick up some pollen and keep on going. It's hard to get the pollen out of these anthers. They're closed, they have pores at the tips. So what do you do to get the anthers to open up and release the pollen? The bee will alight on the anthers and vibrate its wings really fast. The wings aren't moving. It's actually vibrating the wing muscles. And at 24,000 vibrations per second, that is what it takes to make the anther open. We have a picture of this, which hopefully will play. There's no sound with it, but you can imagine the buzz. And can you see that pollen just spilling, spilling out? It's really amazing. I just think that's pretty cool. So there is an adaptation and both plant and animal working together that they have to be the right animal on the right plant and vibrate at exactly the right amount of vibration to open up and get the pollen, get the the pollen. So why would they do that? Um, and they don't release all the pollen each, in each burst. It's about 20%. The idea is that it encourages the bee to make multiple visits to the same type of flower, which means more cross-pollination, less inbreeding, and more fruit and seeds for the plant. So that was touch we looked at quickly and the different adaptations were identifying food in a burrow, vanquishing your predators by giving them a nose full of pain, the porcupine, and finding a mate, the painted turtle. That is the very tip of a barb that's four millimeters and that shows what the, the barbs look like. It's the tip of a quill, what they look like. And here we have another song, which I bet everyone is going to know. Well, that was short. Whoops. Whoops. I didn't mean to go there yet. Did we have guesses? We do. We have Canada Goose. Yes. Yep. Yep. So yes, Canada Goose. But what were they saying? Do we have more detail than that? So now we're going to talk about sound a little bit and about how animals adapt their hearing. So shh, listen to the waves, sound waves, of course. Canada geese have over 15 unique vocalizations. They call to each other to keep them flying in their V formation. They also will call um, parent to juvenile to find out where they are or to another partner or whatever to find out where they are. Land vocalizations include warning hisses and mating calls and calls to establish status. But those unique vocalizations that they use when they're flying overhead, we always just go, oh yeah, there goes the Canada goose. I like to stop for a minute and say, hmm, but what is that Canada goose saying? So next time you hear them fly by, maybe see if you can distinguish different sounds of calls. Even if you don't know, well, that one's calling to find someone else, that one's calling to get them in line. At least you can fine tune your senses to the point where you are hearing, not just, oh, there goes a Canada goose, or there goes a flight of Canada geese, but I hear a couple different sounds happening in there. Um, more about hearing the white tailed deer that picture shows really clearly how big their ears are they're gigantic they are crepuscular and they have cupped ears to collect sound which if anybody's been out and trying to catch sound of something i'm sure you've all done that where you cup your ears to hear something it really works so here is, hearing is important to both prey and predators. The deer is, of course, a prey. He's not a hunter. He's a vegetarian um, herbivore. So they have their ears adapted to help them be aware of what might be out there that wants to eat them. And they will rotate them. I don't know if you've ever walked by a deer and seen them. They look at you. They freeze. But their ears are rotating because they want to collect sound. It's not
focused on their hearing. They're paying attention to it. They're using it. They're always, always listening for something out there to identify that sound and decide if it is a danger or not. And I think they they must think we're dangerous. You've probably heard them hiss and jump when they go blowing their noses out when they go running away from us. And here's another sound. How did I make that work? That's how I did it. Have to wait for this one. Not that. Here it comes. Do we have a winner? Lander, do we have a winner? Um, has anyone guessed yet? I'm checking in the chat box. Um, I'll tell you. Oh, partridge or ruffed grouse or grouse yeah. or woodcock? Mm -hmm, mm hmm Not woodcock, but ruffed grouse. Okay. And there they are. That sound is called drumming. I actually been with a friend who is insisting it was somebody trying to start a motor. And they do sound like that, but it's not. What they're doing is they're drumming. The sound occurs, it's not mechanical. It's not like a lot of other creatures and animals make sound by hitting two things together or by vocalizations. This sound occurs by creating a vacuum under the wings. So they're slowly moving their wings up and down. And then when it goes faster and faster and faster, the air is sucked in and sucked out. And that's the noise that you're hearing is the sound of the air, which I think is pretty cool. It always builds up in a crescendo. It lasts eight to 10 seconds. The wings may be around 15, 50 times. The male does it commonly just before and after sunrise, and it's a mating thing. So it's an adaptation to find a mate. And these poor birds are called bonasa umbellus, and the bonasa means good and good roast. So maybe that's why there aren't quite so many of them around anymore. It's, the only, it's only the male that does that drumming sound. I did that. Oh, look, we have another sound already. Okay. Do we have a guess? Somebody guessed dolphin. And I, uh, and I don't know if warthog, I think it was warthog was for the last one or for this one, but we had two guesses for dolphin. Okay. Is that it? So far. Anybody else want to take a stab at it quick? <laughs> well, Jake, you made this guess earlier. Oh, really? That, hmm, an honor. Yes, so otters make a number of different sounds. This is a river otter. Um, this particular river otter wasn't making that sound. I'm gonna play this. I'm sorry, there's some background noise from me in there. Did you hear that hiss? Mm -hmm. Not sure if he makes any more sounds than that. I think that might be it. Yep, that's it. So there I was looking for um, cankerworm eggs with my back turned to the most exciting thing happening, of course, until I heard it hissing at me. I did not know that Otto was even there until it started giving me its go away, go away from my territory sound. So since I had my phone in hand, I turned it around and, and got that. Um, which is another example of when you go looking for something, you hardly ever find it, at least I hardly ever find it. I find something else, which is far more exciting than what I originally went out to hunt for. But there I was looking for insect eggs and got an awesome sight of a otter hissing at me. And they have really poor vision too. They're, this was daytime, but it was getting dusk. They're out at night and their vision is not good. They spend a lot of their time underwater where it's dark, so they pay attention to, they've got whiskers for touch, but they also use 
hearing or use our hearing to warn us away. So that's predators get away. That's how they've adapted those sounds. Um, and there is a close-up of the otter. Um, someone local took that. Yep, they're chiefly nocturnal. I guess I said most of this. They hiss to warn unwanted people away. If you want to look for otters, so you can sit down on a cushion and hopefully have them come out. It's easiest to look during the daytime for where the, one of the latrines is. It's pretty distinctive, the little piles of sprint it's called, with shells in it. And oftentimes you'll find something called anal jelly, which can be like an ivory color, or I've seen it almost really turquoise, and it does look like this smeary jelly around it. So if you see a latrine, look around, there's probably a body of water, and that would be a good place for you to set up in the evening to do some of your nocturnal animal watching. And as you can see, they're fun to watch. Oh, this is a great sound. Actually, they're all great. Anyone guesses this, I'll be astounded. So, should I just, do we have anyone even trying? Uh, we have some question marks and we have somebody saying, oh, play it again. Oh, okay. <laughs> Where was it? Highly magnified. But apparently you can hear it from several feet away. This is also a place. I did show the slides so people already know. On we go. That is a purring wolf spider. And slightly different audios, but you can tell it's the same creature. So the thumping is its abdomen as it moves. And this is survival. It's courtship. Only the male makes this noise. They have sensilla in their legs, all spiders do, which is, or all the wolf spiders do, which is how they hear and detect vibrations, which is why the male wolf spider can do this when he's attracting a mate. And I just think this is astounding. This is from Professor Utz and Dr. Swager from Susquehanna University. And I could play this over and over again. I hope you don't have bad dreams tonight because it is kind of a big spider making a lot of noise. but we're not done quite with spiders yet. Because they're nocturnal, even though they have eight eyes, they really depend on their ability to feel, to feel vibrations or to make purring noises. They have the ability to sense when some prey has landed in their net. And not only can they sense that, they can tell whether it's a moth or a fly or a honeybee. So they know how to approach it. If it's something like a moth, they don't need to be wary, but if it's a honeybee, it tells them what to expect so they know how to handle a potentially dangerous meal, which probably will still end up being a meal. Oh, more about spiders. I guess I got carried away with spiders. So because they're nocturnal, they build their net, their webs, they weave them, their silk at night. And the most glorious thing to see is going out early in the morning when the dew has landed on them and has sparkly visions like this. I just love seeing spider webs in the morning. If you're the leader of a hike in the morning, you know that you're the one who gets to go through the trail before everyone else and has all those webs, oops, going across your face and so on and so forth. So you'll see webs that weren't there the night before. And I think that's it for spiders. There we go. So wrap up hearing what we covered here is adaptations for survival, for detecting threats from a predator, for establishing territory, for socialization, the geese flying, for hunting, listening to sounds and finding your prey, for finding a mite, mate, the wolf spider, for example, or the grouse, and for nope, establishing territory, which are otters hissing at intruders. And now,
we'll move away from hearing with another sound, which we hear a lot around here, so people may be familiar with this one, unlike the wolf spider, which I had never heard before. Karen, we had a, a lot of people guess fox. We had um, one guess for a barred owl, uh -huh. Fisher, and then a couple Ooh. people chimed in with coyote. And I then, can't see that at the end, yeah. Uh -huh. And then one, um, one submission for a, a baby elephant. <laughs> that was not serious. Okay, um, <laughs> no elephants in Maine. So yeah, I think it already flashed to that screen. Oh, there we go. Yes, that was the red fox, which is a common fox around here. And even though we were listening to it, we're going to be talking about smell now, but that's how I led into the red fox. When they scream, and they often do it in sets, they will stop and start. Sometimes they'll do it in three to 10 second intervals. I hear them normally at night because they're nocturnal, and I normally hear them, usually I hear them more in the spring, although I heard one out here about two weeks ago, which surprised me because I haven't heard one in three or four months. And look at those ears. They're great big, similar to the deer ears, but those are not for catching the sound of a predator. Those are for catching the sound of a prey. You may have seen those videos of a, they're beautiful, of a fox in the snow, motionless, listening for a bowl. And when they see it, they just use their sense of hearing to pinpoint it, pounce on it, and hold it underneath the snow so that they can eat it for a meal. So how do they use smell? They use scent to mark their territory. They also use it for finding a mate and they will use it for cached food and for claiming dominance. What I understand is when they cache their food is that they know where to go back to the food, but when they empty that cache, that's when they leave a marker so that they know it's empty and they don't have to waste their energy um, going and looking for food that isn't there. More on smell. A male luna moth uses the sensory receptors of its antenna to detect a female luna moth. They mate in the dark hours right after midnight, so they're dependent on smell, not sight, to find a partner and reproduce. Another example of how senses other than vision are critical for these nocturnal animals to survive. Luna moths don't live very long, maybe a week. They leave their cocoon, they reproduce, and they die. They don't even have a functional mouth part, so they don't even eat. This drawing is a luna moth male because the antenna are very, very bushy. So if you want to tell apart a luna moth male versus a female, take a look at their antenna because they'll be really bushy on the male for finding a female and not so on the female because she's not out there looking for males. Can't have a thing about smell without including our skunk. So this is our striped skunk. They're so cute. I had three baby striped skunks living under my shed this spring. They emit unpleasant smells when they're threatened to make their predators leave them alone. So they're using it as a defense mechanism. They have two glands, one on each side of the anus, and they produce the skunk spray. However, they really don't use that as their first line of defense. So if they're threatened, they will first back away, then they'll raise their tail as a warning flag, then they'll stomp the ground and they'll slap their tail. So you have plenty of opportunity to avoid getting sprayed if you want. And then as a last recourse, they'll use that. And that is because they have a limited amount of spray and it takes sometimes 10 days for them to replenish that, at which point they're very, very vulnerable. So, huh. And bears have an amazing sense of smell. 
we as human beings have 6 million olfactory receptors, which sounds like a gigantic amount. And we have pretty good senses of smell. I can smell when I'm burning my breakfast in the morning and can smell red fox when I'm out taking a walk. Um, which by the way, smells kind of skunky, but a little bit sweeter. I think it's a really nice smell. And it's nice to know that you've passed where red fox has been recently. So 6 million for us, and then black bears have 1.6 trillion. That's a lot of extra zeros at the end. So black bears have way more ability to smell than we do. Polar bears can theoretically smell a seal through three feet of ice. That's pretty intense too. But a black bear um, can smell something about 18 miles away. So think about that. I mean, we're sitting outside and yes, I can smell my breakfast burning in the kitchen, but the black bear can smell a possible source of food 18 miles away. So the black bear is using its sense of smell to find food. Again, one of the essential things for survival. And snails use smell as well. This is a woodland snail and it's believed to be the only terrestrial animal capable of detecting calcium through its sense of smell, which is essential to its diet for building its shell. They've been observed waving their tentacles and going directly to the source when calcium was introduced into a calcium deficient environment. So they're smelling, analyzing what that smell is, knowing that it's something that they need, and then going to it. They can go, I think, as far as 10 feet to find something. So considering their size, again, that's a really long distance to sense that smell. Not as much as a black bear, but still pretty good. And if you wanna know more about woodland snails, there's a wonderful book called The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating by Elizabeth Toby Bailey. I think she was convalescing. Somebody gave her a pet snail or a snail in a jar. And she wrote this wonderful essay, multiple essays about the snail and observed among other things, its ability to seek out calcium. So smelling for survival, relocating cached food, the red fox, establishing territory, actually also the red fox, finding a mate, a luna moth, finding a food source, which could be a bear or a snail. And there's a food source right in front of us. This is an awesome photograph taken by a woman here in Seal Harbor. And she said that, yes, that turkey did escape. So lived to be lunch another day, which is also a great children's book. Um, everybody, somebody's lunch talks about the life cycle of animals and how they connect to each other. So we're gonna move away and head into taste. I bet people know what this is. Are we getting good answers? We are. Almost everyone <laughs> is saying mosquito, and some people are saying bee. Okay. Is anybody saying female mosquito? Oh, no, no. I don't think so. <laughs> Could be either. Females are the only ones who bite, and yes, that is a mosquito. And now we're going to talk about taste in a couple different animals, different ways that they adapt. The taste bud will never become a flower. No, it won't. So only female mosquitoes bite. They are particular. You should drink wine, not beer, because they like beer drinkers better, and they like people with O blood. They also like people who are sweaty. So if you've been working out, you might want to take a shower before you go out in the evening, because if you go out with perspiration, mosquitoes, the female mosquitoes only, of course, are more likely to take a taste from you. So how are they using taste? Their taste organs or their chemoreceptors are in their tarsus, in their feet. So they're walking on you and tasting whether you are a good meal or not. In Maine, only 40% of our mosquito population will take a meal out of people. So there are other mosquitoes that might land on you, but you're not the kind of host or you're not the food source that they want, so they will move on. So not all mosquitoes are potentially biters for us. 
And it gets a little bit murky here. What is taste and what is smell? Because chemoreceptors are taking data in and are they doing it through their feet or through their antenna? So sometimes we'll be crossing lines here a little bit, but it's still either taste or smell. And whoops, I keep doing that. Any guesses? That's a hard one. I'm going to just move, whoops, nope, don't want to play again. There we go. That is a katydid. And it can be hard sometimes to tell the sounds of the katydids and the crickets. We're going to listen to a few of each and try and help at least put them into the big boxes. Um, so that's going to go back to sound for a little bit, but we're going to be on taste here for a minute. Katydids use their sense of taste to decide where it's a good place to lay their eggs. And when they have something that tastes right to them, which will be a food source for their eggs, for their larva, then they will insert their oviposter and lay the, lay the eggs. But they won't do that anywhere. It has to be exactly the right kind of plant that will offer a good chance of success to the next generation. So again, that's reproduction, adaptation for reproduction using their sense of taste. Katydids have long antenna. It's hard to tell in that picture, but they looks like it got blurred out in the dark, but they are long. And that's one of the things that sets them apart from grasshoppers. And the names between all of these things get really confused too, because sometimes they're called bush crickets and sometimes they're called longhorn grasshoppers, but they're katydids. Often that bright green, they can be bright pink, yellow in addition to that green as well. So here we have, and you're not going to have to guess, I'm just going to play it, um, the field cricket. And all of these are in the order Orthoptera, and they all are our summer singers. So in the spring, we have those wonderful chorus of all the different birds. And then as summer comes along, we've got the grasshoppers and the cicadas crickets and the katydids doing their own wonderful symphony of songs. Some people find it annoying when they're trying to sleep, but that's our cricket. They chirp night and day. They're quiet at dawn, and it is a mating call. An interesting thing about the crickets is most of them are right-handed, meaning their right wing is on top of their left, whereas katydids are just the opposite. Their left wings are on top of their right. They hatch in spring, and they die when it gets too cold, so they overwinter as eggs. And let's listen to the grasshopper. It's going to go again. Oops. So the grasshoppers have pegs on the inner surfaces of their legs, which they rub against a vein in their wing. And that again is to attract a mate for reproduction. So that's how the grasshopper makes sound. The cicada, on the other hand, makes sound very differently. Oops, that's the grasshopper again. There we go. That just says summer in heat to me. And it's always a crescendo like that. And they're not necessarily nocturnal, although there is one dust singing cicada that we have around here. They have timbles on their abdomen. So it's the pulsing sound of the timbles going in against their ribs and out. So it's not like the others where they're stroking their legs on their wings. They do a sound very differently. It goes 300 to 400 times a second. That's characteristic drone. So, this is where I want to read a quote from all of these sounds came from Songs of Insects. And there's a credit at the very end. And they were really generous with letting me use these sounds. 
and generous in telling me, um, giving me this quote to share. These are exciting times. As people far and wide come to fully appreciate our insect musicians, interest will explode. A new industry will be spawned. Before long, hundreds of thousands of Americans will be tuned in and countless people will be planning outings and vacations just to experience the glory of the insect song songs. We are confident that this will happen and we invite you to join the fun. So I encourage you to get out there too and pay more attention to our insect sound songs. I'm not sure that there'll be a new industry spawned. It's a very optimistic thought, but it's a good one. So moving on. It's a plant. What has this got to do with taste? Uh, it's a bit of a long story, but we'll get there. That is a goldenrod ball gall. Inside that, it's red, so there is probably a living larva in there. What happens, how this gall is formed, is the brown winged fly lays its egg on top of the goldenrod, it goes inside, the larva will create a chemical, and so the gall is formed around it. The larva cuts the center of it out to make a little living chamber and spends the summer there. When it's almost mature, it will chew a tunnel almost to the edge of the gall. It doesn't go all the way out. Then it goes back into the little chamber where it will spend the winter. It will pupate in the spring, and then the adult mature fly will travel down that tunnel and no longer has those big chewing parts. So what it does when it gets to the end of the tunnel is it inflates these packages on the end of its head with a fluid and uses it to punch its way out of the gall where it leaves a little hole like that. The gall is brown and dead, it's wintered over, but it does this at times it just right that all the other fall and tall goldenrods are beginning to emerge. And the female still mate will once again go around looking for a goldenrod to lay its egg on. And they're really clumsy. They don't fly very much. So they will walk along the tops of the petals. They'll maybe fly a little bit from one plant to another. That's why if you see one gall in the field, you frequently see many of them. But what the female is doing is much like the katydid, did, is using its feet to taste the plant to make sure it's on the appropriate host, to make sure it is on a tall or a fall goldenrod, not on a rigosa rose or another place where its egg would be sure to die. So a taste adaptation to make sure that the new generation is in a safe place. Taste for survival. There's the Katie did. That's the drawing that shows the Katie did over poster, over positor going into a bit of leaf. So how do they use taste? Is it for selecting an egg site, for choosing a food source, and for predation protection? And here's just a little exercise that has something to do with taste. I'm not really sure how it fits in here, but I like it, so I'm going to share it anyway. It's um, tasting garlic with your feet. So you think about these insects that can go around and they're tasting with your feet. You know what? We can too. So here's an experiment. If you want to take the time to do it, make sure your feet are clean. It'll make it easier. Have a clove of garlic, cut it in half, rub it all over the bottoms of your feet, or just one foot if you want. Um, and then stick your foot in a plastic bag and tighten it a little bit and relax because you're not going to go very far with your foot in a plastic bag and wait maybe an hour, so you might want a book by your side, and you will start to smell and taste garlic in your mouth, which is pretty cool. And yes, it works. But you don't need to go around and find a plant to put your eggs on. So I think we've gone through the different senses. Now I'm gonna quickly look at the seasons and what they have to offer. Our rotating seasons are a conveyor belt heaped with tantalizing stimuli to get all our senses perked up and paying attention. And they are because every season has its own wonderful thing to offer. In the spring, you can ID frogs by their call. Um, now I'm not gonna give you my impersonations, but it's really easy to tell them apart. You probably know the 
banjo sound of one and the trill of another. And for touch, you can stroke the soft yellow green tips of spruce trees. You can taste, actually the spruce tips are also really delicious. I put them in oil and they make it a nice pungent oil to put on your vegetables. Wild mustard is young and green and pungent then. You can smell violets, young leaves, and if you inadvertently step on a skunk cabbage, you will smell the skunk cabbage. So that's spring. Those are things to pay attention to using your senses to seek out. Here's a really nice quote about the seasons from Charles Dickens. Nature gives to every time and season some beauties of its own. In the summer, you can listen to those female mosquitoes beating their wings 300 to 600 times a second. You can touch the back of a fern and feel the raised sarai. Taste wild berries, berries are out. Blueberries, then the huckleberries come after. And you can smell ragosa roses. And if you do this with your eyes closed, maybe you have enough sense of smell, you can do it with your eyes open, but then you'll see. The white and the pink ragosas have a very, very different scent. And if you close your eyes, you'll be able to distinguish one from the other. So that's a good way to ramp up your sense of smell as well. And then in the summer, there's that wonderful clean smell after a summer rain where it's very mineral-like. A lot of dust and dirt has been pushed down to the ground and it bounces up and it smells clean. Um, and the word is petrichor to describe that, which means petri from stone and eker from blood-like. And I'm lost. Nope, there we go. Fall, listen to the group of Canada geese. Listen to crickets, we've listened to them both, but maybe pay attention a little bit more closely. Touch the silky filament-like fur hairs of milkweed. Trees are heavy with fruit, apples, rose hips are out. If you eat them, make sure you eat just the outside, don't get in the seeds, because that's kind of bitter. You can smell decay and skunks are active, so you'll smell skunks out and about. And then there's this thing you probably did as a kid. If you count the number of chirps, that a cricket will make in 15 seconds and then add 37, you'll get a number really close to what the outside temperature is at that moment in time. And, oh, look, one more sound. We're coming up to the last season I'm gonna talk about. So that would give you a clue. Anybody venturing a guess? We have two guesses for ice. And that's what it is. Ice makes a lot of sounds, but I love the sound of ice. That particular clip was somebody skating on really thin ice. I think they said it was like, a, uh, I don't remember, thinner than I would skate on. It was in Norway coming closer and closer to us. And the vibrations and sound are just spectacular. This is ice from Little Long Pond, not far from where I live. So ice is cool. And you may have heard the sound of making ice when you're standing on there and you hear that big boom, that crack. That's not something to be afraid of. That's a good sign. It means that the ice is making greater ice and the pressure is what's making that sound. So yes, winter. You can listen to ice, to something we call winter's wind chimes, which is beech leaves. Beech, like oak, have marcescent leaves. They linger on long after all the other leaves have fallen, particularly on the young trees. So if you walk through the woods when it's snowy, the small beech trees will be making this wonderful rustling sound. You can touch bark. I've got pictures of different kinds of bark and just try and we look at patterns to tell bark apart, but you might want to try and use your fingers. Try and stroke them and go, yes, I do know that's the cedar because it's smooth and friendly. Or stroke a pin cherry and feel the raised vertical lentils and get to know it through the way it feels to you instead of just looking at it. Taste. Spruce gum, usually a red spruce, long white drips terminate in a glob. It looks like amber. It's definitely an acquired taste. People in my family love it. I think it tastes like turpentine. I'm not sure I ever tasted turpentine, but it smells like turpentine. If you are going to do this, bring some butter with you because it gets really sticky and butter will take the stick off of your fingers. 
and make sure you have a good dentist because it will glue your teeth together if it's too sticky. Juniper berries are out. They'll be reddish when they're um, almost blackish with a bit of a bloom on them and they smell like gin if you bite into them. I use them as a seasoning. I use them in soups and stews. In the winter, it's a really nice comforting taste. And smell balsam fir. Of course, it's our Christmas tree. It has that wonderful Christmas odor. Nothing like walking through a nursery of young balsam and just brushing your hands through it and just having that wonderful Christmas balsam fir scent in the air. So if you go out there at night, a few tips for being safe and being comfortable, wear dark clothing, camouflage, wear a hat or close fitting cap so things don't get caught in your hair because you probably won't see them and when something grabs your hair, it can be a bit startling. A cushion to sit on because it's nice to take your time, not to just keep on walking, but to sit and really listen and let sounds come to you and a cushion makes it more comfortable. If you need a flashlight, bring one with a red light so you don't lose your night vision. Know where you're going. Don't go someplace you've never been before where you might fall off a cliff. Be tick and insect smart. If you're going alone, let someone know your plans and be alert and focus on this wonderful world. And why is there a bucket of socks there? That's because I often end up with unpaired socks. And what I do is I cut the foot off of them. I soak them in methrin and then I keep a basket of them. So if I've got friends who want to go hiking and aren't really prepared to go out, it's a tick preventer and works really well. It does something with those socks. So I want to thank you all for listening to me. Uh oh, I went longer than I should have. Um, the night is waiting for you. I hope this really brief introduction, generalist introduction, encourages you to go out and dig deeper and listen more and use all your senses. And I really want to thank all the generous people who responded so quickly with the buzz pollination video, the wolf spider, purr, and all the sounds for the Katie Dids and the cricket sounds, all the songs of insects. They were awesome. Um, lots of photos. I'm not going to go through all that list, but I think this is going to be recorded. So you can, if you want to find out the source of any of these particular images, it will be right there. And that's all I've got. Thank you so much, Karen. That was extremely beautiful and wonderful. And I learned so much and we've had a lot of comments coming in um, saying thank you from participants. Um, uh, we also have some questions um, and I know we're getting close to time, but maybe we can go over just a couple minutes to get a few questions answered if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, one question that we had from a ways back was from Cleo um, asking, can the star nose vole be found in Maine? Yes, it can. Yep, we do have them. And then there's another question. What white berries were the Katie dids on in one of your photos? I think that was a dogwood. I'm pretty sure that was a dogwood. Yep. Um, and then do all species of Katie dids produce different sounds? Yes, they do. And that's the whole interesting thing with I'm just learning about. I just wanted to give a touch to sounds, but now I'm obsessed with them. And the, the whole thing about, yes, there's going to be a whole new experience and soundscape. Um, yes, you can apparently identify to species by the sound of each one of these, that they're all unique. And songsofinsects.com is a wonderful resource. It has a picture of each insect. It has a location map so you can know if we have it in Maine or not, in, so in which part of Maine, and then it will play the sound for you. So you can listen to your sound, record it, come back and compare it to the song, songsofinsects.com. That's the place to go to learn more about insect sounds. That's awesome, Karen. I will put that link in the follow-up email to all participants Great. so they can check it out. Cool. There was one more question that I noted down just so it didn't get lost in all of the comments. Um, is garlic the only thing we can taste with our feet? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But why would you want to taste anything other than garlic? Garlic is so good. So, don't know the answer. Thanks, Karen. Jake, did you notice any other questions or comments coming in? No, Lander, I took a couple mental notes and you hit all of them. So I think, did anybody raise their hand for a follow-up question with, with Karen or? I'm checking now, I believe so. Um, yet we have a few people who have raised their hand. I'm gonna let Paula Merziki um, 
let's see, I need to allow her to talk. So Paula, I think if you unmute yourself, you should be able to ask Karen a question. Hi, Paula. Hi, Karen. Sorry, I really didn't have a question. I just clicked that by mistake. <laughs> but thank you, Karen. I thought it was wonderful and I learned a lot. Thank you. Glad to know you were there. <laughs> Sorry about that, Paula. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then we do have another hand raised from Carol. Um, Carol, I'm going to allow you to talk, and if it was also a mistake, don't worry. <laughs> Hi, Carol. Hi, Karen. Master Naturalist. Yeah, she was a mentor in my class, but that was fabulous. Absolutely oh. fabulous. I I actually learned a lot, and I, I just, it's it's beautiful. Beautiful job. Well done, my friend. Well done. Thank you. Let's go explore together. Oh, I would love that. I would, I'll email you tomorrow. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Thank you, Carol. If anyone has any last questions, either by raising your hand or putting them in the chat box, we can take them now. Um, but once again, Karen, that was so, so fabulous. And we feel so appreciative that you were able to join us tonight. Um, I'm just glad all the sounds worked. <laughs> so. Yeah, they work so well. Yeah. And sometimes technology is tricky and some presenters have had challenges with sharing video clips or things, but yours went really smoothly. Cool. That's great. awesome. That was really great and interactive, Karen. Thank you. Thank you for letting me do it. So, cool. Absolutely. We will send you a recording as well, Karen. So if you want to share it with friends or use it for anything. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that we, I think that we have covered everything in the chat box. Again, just a lot of people saying wonderful presentation and um, so glad this has been recorded. And um, yeah, so once again, thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Yep, bye-bye. Have a great night. Bye, everybody.